Welcome back to another episode of If Only, um, an intellectual freedom colloquy. And I am delighted to be joined by our guest, Peter Coyle, the executive director. Um, and oh, see, I knew I was going to do this, but we're just going to keep I'm, going. I missed you. Yeah. No, it was me, 100%. <laughs> friend. All right, here we go. Yeah. Welcome back to another episode of If Only, an intellectual freedom colloquy. My guest um, is Peter Coyle, the library director and chief executive officer at Sacramento Public. I've known you for years, though, looking across to ALA Council and seeking your wisdom and advice on matters of governance mm -hmm. um, and uh, awareness of the work that we do, but definitely intellectual freedom. Before we would begin, Peter, would you mind sharing a little bit uh, about yourself and um, what you'd like our audience to know about you and your work? Yeah, I think it's important to know that I've I've worked in lots of different types of libraries in different states. So I have an interesting perspective in that I, I, I've i been around in small libraries and public libraries in some very conservative areas and some more liberal areas. So I've, I've been able to experience a lot of different um, types of situations. Um, and, and I think the thing I want to share is that, you know, intellectual freedom is, is the same. It doesn't matter where you live. It, it hasn't changed. It doesn't change. Um, and it may make the conversations different, but the core principles stay the same. That's profound. And I think leads very well into our first question, because we know that society changes. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, if intellectual freedom stays the same, and our first question is, how do you believe intellectual freedom contributes to a thriving society? Um, I'm curious if you think there's some correlation there. I do. I think that, you know, the purpose of intellectual freedom, I think, is really allowing anyone the opportunity to to discover to learn to question to have a conversation to explore um and really that's you know our, our a good colleague at cleveland calls their library the, the um the people's university right and so yeah. i think that that is really true with libraries um you know i wish i'd come up with that great expression but i didn't um <laughs> But really, it's this place where people can can self educate, uh, to the lack of a better phrase. You know, they can come to the library, and they get to choose what they want to do, um, and they can answer their questions. And we, as the library, offer places where people can explore those further in classes and programs and discussions and lectures. Um, and so, I think intellectual freedom in general even though we're talking about libraries and society as a whole, I think mm -hmm. when we have that societal ability to question and ask, and there's a place that the government, right, has established to say, our citizens, not even citizens, anyone who's in this country, whether you're a visitor, whether you're a new American, whether you're here on a, a temporary visa, whatever reason, you can go to the library and you can learn and explore. And I think that that really is key because I've lived in other countries and visited and the public library is a very uniquely American institution. Um, mm -hmm. Other countries have them there in different different ways of doing it, but really the American library is so unique. Um, I, I have to think too that, that because of that, our society has thrived because we have that free expression, that free um, ability to create. You know, if you let someone like, you know, say Albert Einstein, for example, right, he give mm -hmm. him free reign of a lab and, and what is he going to create or math or, you know, whatnot. And I think our society is that same way. Um, you know, I remember the, you know, it's it's shown in that that book, Hidden Figures, you know, where the, the woman steals the book that she can't have because it's in the, the segregated section of the library. Right. And I don't know how how accurate that part of the story is, but I do know that we have a real life story of a of a astronaut who, in his own life, was mm -hmm. almost prevented from checking out a book as a child. Um, and so I, I think that that encapsulates what intellectual freedom does. Um, we have this institution that is government supported that allows people to question and learn, um, versus other countries and other governments where you're told what to learn and what to, and you're told not to question. And here we openly ask it. Um, you know, even in our, in the, the constitution, the bill of rights, it says, you know, we have to petition that we have the right to petition your government for redresses. We have a right to question our government. Um, right. We also have the right to question anything in society. Um, and that's what the library is for. I love the perspective you're bringing here because you and I, 
have talked in circles about the curation piece mm -hmm. of intellectual freedom. Definitely you and I have run in circles about the promulgation and actual free speech. But I do think that there's a lot to be said about pursuit itself and the freedom to have access and feel comfortable and just to openly, privately, yeah, flexibly pursue what you're fascinated with. And then you, you make me think of one of my favorite stories. I'm in a university town. So one of the best things I get to do is have folks come, international students come and like, how much does this cost? Mm -hmm. or what, mm -hmm. Are you sure? And they're just delighted that you're opening up the people's university, an incubator of opportunity to them. Yeah. And so that's so profound. Um, and when I think about the stories um, that, um, I like to share, those are those stories. It's those, those international students that come in and, and, and experience our community in a way that um, I don't appreciate without them. Yeah. Right. Yes. And, and they help me remember how the, the freedom to pursue is profound. And so I'm curious if you have stories, if there are any examples that you might share where like um, intellectual freedom has like positively impacted the communities and organizations that you lead and serve in. You know, I, I don't personally have any any things that come to the top of my mind, um, but I I do know that I have heard colleagues and staff talk about that impact that people have had, um, or or the not the impact that people the impact that lives have had on people's lives. Um, and honestly, I think anything anytime someone has a question answered at the library, I think that's an intellectual freedom. Um, I'll tell a funny story. When I was young, my first job was shelving children's picture books. And I worked in the children's room of uh, the Rochester Hills Public Library. And okay. um, I remember one of the librarians had this question. This little kid came up and asked why popcorn popped. And no one had ever, no, none of, no one had ever, none of the librarians, none of the staff. We, and so she looked it up. And now I know, I now know why popcorn pops. And it's my favorite trivia. It's because the the water in the seed heats yeah. up and it, the steam has to escape, and that's what causes the, the and and I would never it's it's a simple like physics that makes sense when you think about it but but this child had that question came to the library to answer that question, um, and one wouldn't think that that's like a huge thing, but what did that question do to that child? What, what other questions did that prompt? And how did that start them on that journey? And it may have been that one question and they moved on, but did it did it incite something in them about science? Did it excite them about the library? Did it did it make them, did something germinate ha -ha, in their heads themselves, <laughs> you know? Um, and I, I have to wonder if, you know, that's what intellectual freedom is. It's not necessarily having a discussion, a discourse about some controversial topic, right? And we we have some good examples here in the country right now of, of of people having some very difficult conversations and whether those are, are appropriate in the library or how people react, like all those things are happening. But the idea is that that and I think intellectual freedom gets that that part of the the narrative that it's this really big, serious topic. And it is. What? Yeah, those are really big serious questions. But but it's also those those little children wanting to know why popcorn pops. It's it's that whole gamut, and we do it not just for those serious conversations. We do it so the kid can find out why popcorn pops. Um, you know, I think that's really important too um, for our textbooks to be accurate. You know, what we teach right. our children is important, and you know, as we read this last you know time is a war text, but a couple of years ago about the the publisher that had. Um, and I remember the story wrong because it's been a while, but the, the textbooks that had um, uh, false information about the benefits of enslavement to people and you yes. know, the, the conversation about, you know, it didn't know about forced migration. It was just, it was just this lens on what actually helped you so wrong. And that's yeah. also intellectual freedom. Intellectual freedom is defending truth and accuracy. It's not right. saying, no, you can't have that opinion, but it's saying, no, that's not actually what happened, right? Enslavement was not beneficial for those people. Like, right. no, that's, no, you know. Um, We're going to shed sunlight on this. Yeah, and yeah. Let the world see it for what it is and what it yeah. was. Yeah. yeah. And, and I shouldn't have said those people. I mean, those who were enslaved. I didn't mean that was a, a, an inarticulate phrasing. Um, yeah. But I totally understood what you meant, yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's... And that's intellectual. It's that whole gamut. Um, and and we always I always tell people, 
we as librarians aren't protecting a book. I'm not protecting, you know, Beyond Magenta or Heather Has Two Mommies or what. I'm not protecting those books. I'm protecting the right to have that book. Um, you know, it doesn't matter necessarily what the book says, but we have to protect the right to be able to access it because what I want to read and what you want to read are, are probably different. Um, maybe not. Yeah, I see your stuff. Maybe we read a lot of same things, you know, but but that shouldn't yeah. matter. It should be that I want to read what I want to read and I should be able to do that. I think you make several great points here, um, particularly um, when we go back to your first point about the right to, re to grievance, right? We're prepared for um, materials to be challenged. We have policies and procedures in place. We recognize that we are, in many cases, most of us government employees and that redress affects us as well, but we don't run away from it. We lean into it. And so right. protecting the process by which we can talk about these materials feels like, yeah, the overarching place where I would want to focus my attention if I wanted to have like the greatest impact. So I, I really appreciate you bringing that to light. And then I, I love the, why the popcorn pops. You, you gave me some citizen science today. And <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. And it makes me think about all the times you and I have sat in like conferences and listened to keynotes, every single library you've had an author visit, almost invariably they will have that story about bravely, you know, trepidatiously maybe coming up and having a question answered and how it, they saw it as a pivotal moment that transformed their life. So maybe that slow and steady, uncelebrated work that we do is the intellectual freedom, which is beautiful, but also hard to quantify for its importance when we're trying to impress it upon those who are in it with us to safeguard, right? Yeah. And I and I think too, that's why customer service is so important, that friendly, mm. welcoming, inviting library places, because we don't want yeah. people to be turned off and leave the library. We want them to be able to come back and get those that information. Um, so really it's, you know, we are, we're not like the grocery store where people have to go to us to buy milk. Like this is, pe right. people choose to come to the library. Um, and so we have to make sure that we are meeting the needs of our community. And that's a wide community. You know, that's, that's, a, that's you know, and that's, that's one of the reasons why libraries are doing so many different things. And, and I'll be honest, one of the reasons we're doing so many different things too is because the lack of funding in government, right? We're doing things that other institutions used to do public health used to do um, a lot of those things, right? And so we're yeah. picking up that slack. And that's not to say those individuals, those institutions aren't doing the best they can. It's that our elected officials have, because there's only so many pieces of the pie, they've allocated the pie differently. Um, and I think it's incumbent on us as libraries to continue to uh, meet the needs of our community. But I think we sometimes stretch ourselves too thin too. You know, we try to do too yeah. much, um, but that's because we we understand the importance of this. We want people to have, like, this is such a pivotal, important part of what we do. It's hard yeah. to say no sometimes. Well, like two minor examples in the state of Iowa is that the workforce development centers and the DOTs uh, shut down and they moved them to kiosks or software in our libraries. And that's not only livelihood and mobility and access, Peter, that's also like voter suppression if those kiosks aren't working and you're required to show an ID, you know, to engage in your civic rights. Um, so I think you're right. It feels like the stakes are increasingly high despite the resources continually to be dwindled. And having those conversations are crucial because if you're in, in it, you are aware of it. Um, can I also just honor your point about customer service? At our desks, we don't say, did you find everything you were looking for today? We asked, did the Iowa City Public Library have everything you wanted? Because that's an opportunity. It's not saying you didn't find something. It's, it's a completely different way to frame a question where you're open. And the two outcomes are, they rocked it. And you're giving them operant conditioning to remind them that they rocked it today. And we appreciate that they came and spent their time because yeah. they don't have to get milk here. But then if yeah. we didn't find it, that's an opportunity to help too. So either, oh yeah, my library did everything I wanted it to today, or you, you, you're you interested in helping me even do more. And it's like, of course. So yeah. I think that openness in building containers is important. And it leads me to my third question. I'm like, so how do you think communities can address this collaboratively? Because that's like a microcosm of like, yeah. I'm gonna make my language open. I'm gonna make the opportunity open. I'm gonna be a guide, I'm, you know? How do we do that for more crucial conversations where the stakes are more, more significant? I think it's, 
you know, we're not required, and I wouldn't ever advocate equal time at the library, right? That that I think isn't that's not our that's not our mission. Um, but I do think that we can have those difficult conversations. We can have those speakers and those topics that are um are are difficult and hard. But we can do it in a way that is non-judgmental. Um, you know, one of mm -hmm. the things we often libraries do is we have academics or people who have researched or read or written about a topic come talk about it, right? right. And they typically do it, um, you know, everyone has biases, right? But I think right. what we do is we try and find people who are experts, who know what they're talking about, and they can share their expertise, their information with us. And while they may have a particular viewpoint, if it's if it's bolstered or proven by the research, then then that's the truth, and then they're sharing information. Um, right. You know, now if you have some that's sharing information that isn't necessarily factual or isn't truth, or is maybe opinion, I think that's mm -hmm. where you get into the conversation about um, you know how you're being collaborative and is a library putting forward a particular viewpoint. Um, yeah. But I think it's really important uh, for us to remember that that we need to do things that meet the needs of the community. I think too often we as library workers do things that interest us, you know, um, yeah. or things that were popular 10 years ago. Um, you know, there mm -hmm. is there are things that, that we just love and we like we keep doing, but we have to also adapt to the needs of our community, right? Um, and that's hard to do because we do programs and people love them, but yeah. sometimes they just, they have their life cycle, you know, and you don't want to let down the couple people who still really are diehard fans about that program or service, but we have to sometimes shift. Um, and we've kind of gone away from the question you asked, I think, but I, but I think the idea here is that yeah. it's a changing conversation and those collaborations change, but we have to collaborate with our community because you know, we don't have all the answers. Um, and we we are we are often the conveners or the connectors of conversations, not the not the owners. Right. Yeah. That's a lot of responsibility because like in this world of disinformation, misinformation, content versus knowledge, or even just an oversaturation of information which elevates it somehow in the zeitgeist. Yeah. Because other things aren't getting their due or they're not getting the equal amount of airtime. I I love your point about balance. I, I think that's profound. And it makes me think about the the populations that you directly serve, whether it's like 53 to 56,000 members, give or take for the American Library Association, or if it's like, I'm going to guess around 1.2, 1.3 million for Sacramento. 1.5, but yeah. Oh my, wow. You, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Even more impressive. I just think about how do you, in your various circles, um, make that happen? So, I, I mean, I see it at the larger level. Level where you're like, okay, we're going to mindfully create opportunity and, yeah. and facilitation. But you and I run some interesting circles and I find myself code switching between them sometimes, right? Because I'm in a purple state, yeah. right? And yeah. my ICPL hat is not my ALA executive board hat, which is not my ILA president hat, which is not my gender queers about me hat, Yeah, you know? Yeah. So I'm curious, like, how do you at the personal level try to foment that diverse perspective so that you're getting it all? Yeah, it's, much and that's... Yeah, that's a good good question. Um, it's definitely difficult, you know, it can be. Um, but also I think that's part of communication is knowing how to tailor your message and how to have a conversation with different people. You know, you, yeah. you talk to a, a, a child a little differently than you talk to an adult. You know, you, you have to modulate yourself. And I think we do that in right. situations and circumstances too. Um, you know, if I'm going to go you know, to my library board and give them a presentation on our budget, that's very different than I'm talking to my friends of the library about the annual budget. Like it's a different level okay. conversation. And right. I think the same thing is in librarianship in library work. We do that with our customers. We, mm -hmm. we have, I think, I think we as library workers learn a very interesting skill mm -hmm. and that is how to communicate with different people in society. Because yes. we are, a place where anyone can come in and you can have someone um you know walk in who is a world famous actor and then the next person may be someone who's unhoused um and in fact i my last library it i worked in a town that had a lot of famous people that lived in it 
Um, yeah. And some of those people would come to the library and we would help them. Um, I helped the editor of a, of a national news magazine once, right? Oh, Didn't know he was yeah. in there. He, he, he looked, he came to the library, he wrote his, his, wrote his articles and that was his work from work from home office. <laughs> and then the next person that could come use that table could be a kid doing a science project, you know, but we as library right. workers deal with a wide variety of situations and people. And I think we have to, we learn how to do that. Um, and so I think that is a skill that we then take in the community and we have to adapt that to the different groups and people we talk to and figure out how those collaborations need to work. Um, and it can be tricky and can be hard, but I think that, you know, we, by the nature of what we do, we learn those skills. That, that is fascinating. And I'm going to, I'm going to hold that. Um, I'm getting a lot of gold nuggets this, this conversation, yeah. but um, yeah, I, I do think you're right that we're almost like, supportive chameleons in a way right yes yes I, I like that phrasing i like that we are we are yeah yeah and so i appreciate as we go through our questions we kind of talk about like larger systems we talk about interpersonal but i think it's important to talk about how you believe technology is, in, is influenced the intellectual freedom discourse and whether you see positives or negatives and if so what you're jazzed to address like i i would love to know what you're specifically interested in focusing on maybe in yeah. 2024 you know, I'm, I've been in libraries long enough um, mm -hmm. to remember when my library had, not this library, the library I worked at, had mm -hmm. a website mutual linking policy. I don't know if you remember, this, back in the day, you would email someone, hey, I'm going to put a link to you on my website. Will you put a link on yes. my, and, and libraries, we had pages that had community resources, community information, and we curated that information, right? We shared that. Yes. And we've kind of gotten away from that because now like search engines are are optimized. But I, I do think that sometimes I, I'm kind of sad we got away from that because mm. there isn't a lot of times one place to go. Well, you know, I just moved to a town where what's the trash pickup where what's yes. the recite like you have to find and we just kind of we used to have like web pages on our websites that would say, you know, here's all those things in your community. Here's the, here's the soup kitchen. Here's the senior center. Here's the, the athletic, like we would do all, we don't do that anymore. Um, and that's, that's just how we've changed. Right. So I think society and in technology has changed. And the, mm. the part that, that I'm reminded about that is that libraries were very careful about making sure that they were providing links to reputable organizations and information. Yes. Um, and I'm not sure how to phrase this exactly, but we don't mm. necessarily have that opportunity with the books we buy. We don't have the time to read and review and look at every book. Right. So mm -hmm. sometimes there are things on our shelves which are not accurate, which are not up to date, which are wrong. Um, and this is where I think it really gets into that idea of of accurate information and what the library's role is, you know, is our job to be the purveyor of, of fact, or is it something to provide information? And is information mm -hmm. anything that anyone wants, or is it a true piece of information, right? right? The information that, you know, the earth is flat. Is that a true piece of piece of information? I don't know, but it is information, right? but it's, so, so where does that line get drawn? And technology, I think, has really impacted that because we don't have the opportunity to, there's so much on the internet, we, we can't necessarily provide links to everyone to what is accurate and up to date. And mm -hmm. a lot of what we spend our time doing is showing people how to find information, is that information literacy, you know, you, the first couple of search results are not actually your search results, they're the, um, uh, they're the sponsored ads, the paid results. And then, you know, is that first link, is that really your state's link to your benefits? Or is that the scam website that everyone sees because it's been paid to be at the top of the page, you know, right. and, and shifting that to social media and closed private groups and people right. sharing information and, you know, you don't have the opportunity as a library worker to be involved in every conversation on the internet. And so information gets misspread. Um, mm -hmm. It's like those old chain letters your your, your <laughs> old aunt would send. You know, I remember getting one from, 
you know, about a stamp the post office had made and it was anti-Christian and, you know, it was, it was not true, but those went around. Yes. And that's why websites like Snopes got developed because people, people were looking for that. And we've kind of gotten away from that debunking, debunking the myth. People used to share those right. things and, and we've kind of stopped doing that. At least I've noticed that. Um, yeah. So I don't know if I answered your question, but those are the thoughts I have about technology. Like it's, it's just this big thing and it's, it was good and it grew. Yeah. And I, I think we just didn't keep up with being able to, it's a, it's, it's too big a fish to fry at once. And I don't think I, it can now. Yeah. I think it's just unwieldy. But I think you struck at a viable option or like at least like something that would mitigate it. I remember when I was a teen librarian, I would love to get into a room. Once I piloted the program to get to the public schools where they were a captive audience and we built our right. programming, and then I wanted the caregivers because I wanted that train the trainers piece, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's a lot to ask a 14 year old to review the accuracy of a website i'm dating myself a little bit but i did some of that right. yeah and it was it was much more profound to kind of help parents and caregivers navigate those channels on social media and so i do wonder if it is like understanding that even books on shelves like if we're progressing in a rate that's hopeful you know a lot of the things on our shelves will be inaccurate or or appalling maybe even in 50 years i hope that society will continue to progress you know and that um, I will be seeing kind of, you know, like, like my gener like yeah, they're just, yeah, I, I want us to keep growing. I don't think we've arrived. Um, but yeah. with the internet, it's so rapid and it's so quick. And yeah, I, I'm just rambling here, Peter, but it kind of reminds me of instead of like the, the Orwellian where no information will be available. It's like the Randy and where it's like, it's so readily available that we don't even know how to surf it or value it. Well, and, and I think that's where we're at, quite frankly, you know, people, yeah. people aren't able to look at a lot. They, they're not, they don't, have, I think critical thinking has, has changed somehow. And I'm not sure what that is, but mm -hmm. um, you know, just the other day, there was some sort of tweet about, um, some there was something that happened on the internet with ghosts in a store or something and it went over the internet and it's like people believed it you know and you know it's kind of like you go back to the you know pizza pizza gate you know there's this yeah people just believe what's there and there's no critical thinking and there's no investing there's no skepticism we just trust what's there and i think that's part of intellectual freedom is teaching that that critical analysis to be able to determine um, not sure what is true and fake because we have to you have to learn that, but you can look for the signs of of what's reasonable and you know it's like like we you, how do you learn the sign of a scam? It's the same way, you know. Right. We have to we have to learn that. But I think we're so busy and there's so much information. Um, I think we just sometimes don't have time or don't or don't be we don't take the time or have the time or feel we have the time to really dive in and, and examine it. Um, right. Yeah. Well, and so, yeah, I mean, you just give me a lot of food for thought here. Cause like we both work for municipalities too. So like I'm in the smaller enough institution that I've actually contributed to city websites and help them curate it. And like, they'll sometimes follow us in our, in our, our um, contract. So I've had the luxury of that. And now I've had the luxury of supporting different departments on, this is how folks look for that information. Cause when they call me, this is how I look for it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But there's also like an access concern because when people increasingly get their information from social media platforms and then you see like social media platforms just like eliminate accounts from like municipal entities. It's just sort of like it makes you wonder if there's like a training folks element here, but also really thinking about investing in something that's a little bit more publicly resourced, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Know. Very true. Yeah. yeah. I think so that that's, that's, yeah. that's hard too. You know, it's, it takes a lot of money to do those things. It does, but yeah. I appreciate dreaming here with you and, yeah, and yeah, these, yeah. Chase, these thought bunnies um, yeah. uh, to get us back on the road. I really, I do appreciate, this is so much fun. I'm, I, I'm, I could do this for nine hours with you. You're just great. Um, <laughs> I am curious though. Um, now that we've talked about your own circles, we've talked about the structures you're responsible for. We're talking about the digital age and the World Wide web. I am curious about where you think policies come into play. What are some policies, whether it's like free post, free press, free speech, free libraries, what do you think are crucial places in policy to be keeping our eyes on? I think uh, quite frankly, I, I think it's the first is funding. 
Um, when you yeah. when you mentioned that your state had moved those kiosks, my first thought was, well, are those less hours that they were open at the previous places? Did they give you funding to build? Like, you know, I, I you know, yeah. and I'm going to say probably it's not the same hours. And probably you didn't get more funding to do those, right? Nope. And did nope. you get training to troubleshoot the like all those things, right? And right. and you're in a different state. I've never been to your library. I've never like, but I can tell you right away what those problems are because it's systemic with with our industry, with how government works, right? Right. And and I, I don't know why that is, you know, in mm. um it's it's such a bizarre bizarre scenario, quite frankly, you know, um, that we are always expected to do more with less, um, yeah. and I, I think we sometimes, um, you know, those partnerships are important, and maybe those conversations were had, and maybe there isn't any more money, right? And maybe that was that was the best option available. So I don't want to second guess that, but I I have to wonder. Um, you know, we can we can write policy and say it's important, but at the mm -hmm. end, if we're not funding it, is it really important to us? Um, you know, and and you know, I used to work in a, a state legislature, and my boss would always say, you know, politics is the art of the doable, right? Wow, and I like so, that. Yeah. yeah, and so it's you know, that's really what is it? What at the end of the day, what can be done? And whether that's collaboration, whether it's compromise, whether it's funding, and you know maybe those things were the art of the doable. Maybe that was the best solution. Um, mm -hmm. But we have to, we have to. We, I think we can't ignore that. I think we have to say, okay, we did this, but you know, you didn't give us more money, and we're still doing it. And you know, I think sometimes we're afraid to say no. We're afraid to poke the bear that bite the hand that feeds us because so many of us are in institutions where you know we are you know, one, <laughs> one minor recession away from major budget issues. You know, I think mm -hmm. I'm looking at the next two to three years, looking at our budget projections nationwide, locally, like it's, it's a little, it's going to be a little dicey. I think that's a couple of years. I think there's going to be some, some hard choices. Um, so what are those policies? What is government saying is important? Are libraries important? Is there a policy that, you know, libraries will do X, Y, Z. And, and I don't think we have those. I think we have these institutions. Um, we spend a lot of time in government. You know, we have state agencies that set curriculum for schools, um, mm -hmm. both K through 12. And, um, you know, even, even there are accrediting bodies statewide that determine that the curriculum meets standards. Um, mm -hmm. We have most other professions who have um, uh, licensure requirements and CE. We don't have it as librarians, you know, but we have a very demanding, changing profession. Um, yes. And so I think in terms of policies, I think it's important to have policies that support your staff. Because um, I think a lot of people think, oh, I just build a library, put librarians in it, and it's there. But it's a lot more to it. It changes, it evolves. We have to we have to keep up with technology. You know, if you want us to be the, you know, the the people that your grandma comes to to fix your electronic device that you got her for Christmas, well, we've got to have the training and staff to do. We also have to have that technology to know what it is they're bringing into us. Right. You know, we're often behind the curve in a lot of ways because of that funding. Um, mm. So I think we're talking about policies. I'm not talking about intellectual, but I think the first is we have to have money to be able to pr protect what we do. I mean, you can't you can't do the necessity, the necessary, if you don't have the people to do it. And you know, a lot of our library workers, we are stretched thin. We're struggling just to just to keep our desks open. You know, yeah. um, and the pandemic has made it harder to find workers. Um, people are have moved on it's it's just a different situation um yeah. but i also think in terms of policy i think we have to have those policies to protect library workers um you know we are yeah. in a situation where we have um seen nationwide library workers threatened we've seen violence we've seen the county next to ours had multiple bomb threats um so these are these are public libraries um you know another another neighboring actually a neighboring library both these County's neighbor me, um, you know they had Proud Boys show up with with guns outside a story time. You know that was a drag queen story time. Um, 
So I think yeah. policies to protect library workers are important. We have policies and laws that protect transit workers in lots of places. Right. Um, and a lot of places it also the law also protects government workers, but it doesn't always protect the library workers for some reason. And I'm not sure why that is. Um, you know, excellent so, correlation there. You know, yes. Yeah. So that's maybe not quite intellectual, freedom, but I think we have to we for, for me, I'm sure I I'm sure thinking more of intellectual freedom as as really it's this high lofty goal, but we have to yes. have a foundation for us to to really do that effectively. And if we can't even be safe and protected, which we're seeing. I've seen a mm -hmm. lot of library workers shrink from the fight. And and I'll be honest, I don't necessarily blame them, right? I no. mean, I tell my staff, your safety is paramount. You know, as, right. as much as intellectual freedom is the 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 thing that we strive for, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's I wouldn't ever want anyone to put their life in danger to that. Like it, it just seems, you know, there there's it, it's just a different situation right now. Peter, you're striking at my heart because I think you're right. It uh, It's sustainability. Um, and it's also the fact that the most important resource in a library is its people, yeah. right? On both sides of that desk. And so Iowa City Public Library um, experienced both a drag queen story time protest and a bomb threat last year. And my job, whenever I introduce myself as the Community Access Services Coordinator, I, I when people are like, what is that? I'm like, I resource three great teams of awesome staff, like that's my job. Like I identify myself more as an advocate, the more mm -hmm. I move into leadership. And so I think you're right, especially those of us who um, have this privilege of leadership have to really look at it holistically because these are lofty goals if we can't keep the doors open and we can't keep our staff secure. And it makes me, if I can ask you a sub question, wonder. Um, so, you know, past president of ILA, we had the second most library adverse bills in the nation last year, a little busy and very grateful for folks who are showing up. But it's making me wonder at this point, because we had two like avenues of concern with all the bills, funding and intellectual freedom. Do you think we're fighting like a two front war? Sorry to use the battle language, because it, it sort of feels like there's a culture war at place. Is it is there? Is it intentionally distracting us from the class war? I know I'm, I didn't mean to spitball a question unprepared, but I'm just like, I'm wondering at this moment, you know, because this has happened to us again and again. You and I um, are familiar with like the IMLS dollars going to zero and having to fight just for what we used to have from 2016 to 2022. And I'm just like, we're never even given the position to ask for more. <laughs> so sorry, that was a long ramble, but I'm curious, like, do you feel like there's a connection here? You know, my first blush i'm gonna say yeah i think you got something there you know like it makes sense right that's and that's and that is i think that's a tactic in lots of things is is to be distractionary right and to if you and to use your your battle language right if you have to fight a war on multiple fronts that's what you do right you you try and you try and wear out the the enemy for lack of a better term mm -hmm. um I, I would say i'd say yes but i also and i'm gonna be a little snarky I don't cool. know if the other side's smart enough to know that. Okay. Yeah, fair. But, but I'm not, I, I don't want to, I don't want to give them that much credit, but at the same time, I have to wonder, maybe they are, you know, may, and, and maybe we shouldn't be under, um, underestimating their abilities. Maybe they are, maybe they are mm -hmm. that. Smart. Um, and maybe we're the ones that have taken too long to realize that. I don't know, you know, but mm -hmm. I do think that they are inextricably linked you know, funding okay. m money makes the world go round, and yeah. how how do you silence people? You take away their their money, you know, and that's why that's why in political campaigns, money is so important because money gives you voice. And if you're having an institution, and you want an educated people, yeah. if you take away the thing that educates them, and the only thing they hear is the internet and the pundits on TV they're going to start believing that the earth is flat despite Galileo and people thousands of years ago proving us that it wasn't right. Um, you know, this, this is not the inquisition of the dark ages. Like we know that the sun revolves, the earth revolves around the sun. You know, it's not the other yeah. way around, right? We know this, we have pictures, we have video, even before we had deep fit, deep fakes, we had this information. So right. So that to me is the, you know, it's, it's, it's a little um, exasperating that, mm -hmm. you know, even now we're having the conversation, the ba basic science question of, 
right. know, is the is the sun the center of the universe or is the earth you know and, and that's and I'm being a little a little hyperbolic there but that's really the conversation we're having is is we're questioning basic science and oh yeah and, wait to hear how they think popcorn pops now <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah right yeah I mean you know but I think too that also comes to funding for schools too like if we don't teach and can't educate children and and quite frankly, if we don't pay our teachers and our library workers a living wage, all those things, you know, I think it was, um, I think it was, and I, was it 300,000 workers left the library profession, I think, according to the Bureau of Labor um, in the yeah. last, you know, three, four years. That's a lot, you know, and, and there's lots of reasons for that, but, but that number is staggering. Um, and we also, have, you know, yeah, I, it's just there, there's not to be extra sad. Oh, sorry, please. Yeah, so we can talk about policy, and I think it's important. But if we have the money to do the policy, the policies don't do any good. Like it's like it's like SIPA, right? We have the Child Internet Protection Act, and you have to have that. You have to filter to get to get money, to get funding, right? And we filter here at Sacramento Library. It's been done for years. It's not something that that I started. Um, you know, do I think that filtering's appropriate? Personally, I don't think it is. Um, but we save millions of dollars doing that. Yes. Um, so that is the government enforcing a policy. So if the government yes. really wanted us to be successful, they would give us money and say, mm -hmm. here's the policy and, and make us do the good things, right? Um yes. And we have that example with with internet and funding. So I don't know why we aren't looking to do those things. You know, if your library does this good thing, you get more funding. I really, and I know there's, this has been controversial, but I really liked what Illinois did. You know, yeah. that if you ban a book, you have to pay the state back any state funding for that, you know, what, whatever the, the the bill was. But there was some, right. some attachment of some financial um, penalty. I think that's how serious intellectual freedom is. If you're a doctor, you have discipline. If you're a lawyer, you have discipline. If you're an accountant, you have discipline. But if you're a librarian and we're teaching yeah. people we're and, and we're showing them, there's, there's no recourse, you know? And I think that that is, yes. that to me is, is troubling because mm -hmm. we have an avenue where um, we as a profession don't have any teeth to say information is, needs to be accurate right even though it's the absolute foundation of society yeah, yeah. And, um, and we have great professional statements and we beautiful things i think but we have no teeth and so you know it's not like i don't know i'm trying to give a good example but you know we are we are at a spot where i think we we don't have a whole, we have more power than I think we do, but it's hard to see where the power is. Right. And how to funnel it into yes. productive chains. Um, yeah. Cause I love the fact that we are learning from each other. We just borrowed Connecticut's ebook bill and are throwing it out there. I'm calling it joyful offense. Cause I don't think it has an opportunity to pass, but it, it puts libraries out there in a conversation that needs to be taking shape. It's a conversation it, starter. Yeah. yeah. But then I also, I agree with you. Like, with what's going on with Illinois, um, I, I think it was an acknowledgement of something too. Like this work does need to be done. I'm excited to see what New Jersey's looks like. Um, but then also just the fact that um, these are political appointments if our detractors want them to be. So maybe it's time to start acknowledging that and, and, and accepting the board game for what it is, right? Because we're not creating that environment, but I won't name states, but I think you and I both are well aware that um, the state librarian could be considered very well in a couple of our states, a political appointment, or it's perceived as such, at least optically. Oh, I don't want to speak for you. I'll but, say yeah. in California, it is a political appointment. I mean, yeah. it, it is. In a lot of places, it is a political appointment because um, yeah. it's like every government agency, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and here in California, our, our state librarian he was not a librarian when he was, when he was appointed. He has become one. He's got his degree. Um, huh. Greg Lucas, delightful man. He's he's a he is a strong advocate for libraries. Um, oh. So I think it's an example of you don't always have to be a librarian to love libraries, um, oh. you know. But I do think you have to have an understanding and a foundation. And I give I give Greg credit 
for going and getting that degree so he can so he can fully understand what it is and be part of that conversation you know so i i fully you know i fully support that um and even if he didn't get his library degree making sure you understand the situation and and understand the industry that you're not part of or haven't been part of um right. you can learn those things and you can still be a strong advocate you know most of our friends of the libraries are not librarian or library workers they're people who love the library um and i'm making i don't have any data to show that just anecdotally that's typically your friends group are not a bunch of retired librarians um you're absolutely right there might be a couple but it's the people and they know the value of libraries. So that is something that is, you don't have to teach. People can learn that very easily by experience. Well said. And it kind of leads as we kind of get down to our final questions. You and I have really talked about this at, I'd say 25,000, 10,000, 5,000 feet. But now that we have this opportunity to just um, um, share what we would, we would say to folks, you know, sitting across the coffee table from us or at a community event, what would you recommend with your body of history and advocacy uh, for the individual to do to further and promulgate intellectual freedom in their communities? What are some low hanging fruits that we can apply? Yeah, I think if we're talking about non-library workers. I would say if you're just a, a, not just, if you're a library user, if you're a resident, if you're a, you know, a student or whatnot, um, use your library. You know, even if you don't, mm -hmm check something out all the time having your library card that i mean that shows usage i mean you i don't know of any other city or municipal entity that can say we have you know in some places 70 percent of our community use us you know like that that's a voluntary thing that people do people people want to um so i think using library is important um and advocate for your library serve on your library board, be part of your friends, um, write your letter to your congressperson um, or your elected official. I think I think those are important. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're a library worker, I think you can make sure that you are staying up to date yeah. on intellectual freedom. And, you know, there are there are ways that libraries can protect themselves and their resources from um, from harm. Um, and I say that literally, like there are, you know, there are places where books have been stolen and burned and and cut up. And, and you know, I think that we saw that in, right. you know, the the pride books that were stolen. And then, you know, we have to be creative. You know, libraries put up the QR codes of the ebook so that people could still check out the book, even though the physical one was taken away. Um, yeah. I also think that speaking up is important. Um, even if there's not a a controversial thing happen, going to your city council meeting and saying, hey, I had this great interaction with the library, letting the people know how valid it is, I think it's important. And I think we as a profession need to do better about telling our stories, the impact. Mm -hmm. We we don't have a national marketing campaign that shows the importance of libraries. We don't have, I mean, even even realtors, right? You buy a house, you have a realtor. They have advertisements, but everyone knows you have a realtor. Like, but we don't do that as librarians. You know, it's a lot of money. We don't. We're not. We're not for profit. So we have to be creative. Um, and I think it's knowing what our skills are and playing to our strengths. And I think that that's important. Right. I think sometimes we stretch ourselves too thin. So I would suggest, you know. Libraries sometimes have to be more focused. We can't be everything to everyone, but maybe we can do two or three things really well, but you can't do 12. Um, and that's hard to do, yeah. you know? Right. I've used battle language and I'll use hunting language. I'm sorry, but I always think of the phrase, the hunter that chases two foxes catches neither, you know? And I, you know, I would just take them home and put them in a little cat bed and they'd be my pets, these foxes, <laughs> but I, I, I could only probably catch one at a time. Um, and so last year we focused on intellectual freedom because we needed to protect those teacher librarians in my state. And this year we got to go back and talk about funding because yep. um, again, we could only focus on one. And so um, I'm jazzed because having this conversation with you has just kind of been a shot in the arm uh, right before the legislative session really kicks right. off for me. So I yeah. really appreciate the gift of your perspective and time. I'm jazzed about the idea that there's always something to learn about this conversation, your perspective about the freedom of pursuit and discovery by itself is just something I'm going to be chewing on for the rest of the week. And yeah. um, 
you have me jazzed, I guess is what I'm saying. And so I'm curious as we kind of wind down our conversation. Um, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to do. And we do probably need to hyper focus on something that will keep us sustainable so we can go back and grab the other things. But what specifically has you jazzed about the current intellectual environment? Because I imagine you must you must find goals that you chase or you wouldn't be so dedicated to the good yeah. work you do. You know, I, I think what has me jazzed is, is, as far as I know, every yeah. lawsuit, every court case that has come to the courts, wherever it's working, intellectual freedom has been successful in every single case. Right. Yeah. All the laws that have been passed have been, yeah. you know, either overturned or been injunctions or healed. Like, I, I don't think, I, I think we are winning the battle for lack of, you know, you know, but yeah. it doesn't mean we can be complacent. It doesn't mean the battle is going to be, it's going to stop anytime soon. I think it's going to continue. And I think it's going to get a little worse. But I do think that as we have, have those precedents set, I think, I think the conversation is going to change. It's going to mm. slow. Um, as people realize that no, the Constitution says you can't ban books. Like that's that's the law in America. Like it's it's pretty basic. Um, you know, it's it's pretty. I mean, it's pretty fundamental, and it's it's kind of it. It makes me wonder if we do need to spend more money on education so these these people can go back to school and learn basic American history. Like this is this is this is not complicated. And maybe that's why it's so infuriating, right? Because these are basic things that we you know you know. Uh, Jeff Foxby, are you smarter than a, than a third grader, right? This is third graders yeah. know this stuff, you know? Right. Like, yeah. you know oh. It's it's oh. basic, it's basic American history. Um, you know, and we and I'd say this, we wouldn't have America without Thomas Paine and those those pamphlets. Like the freedom of speech oh. is so fundamental to America's existence that it's so amazing that it's trying to be to be pushed aside, um, you know, but we know that dictators and despots, that's what they want to do. It's about power and control. Um, right. And so what I'm jazzed about is the fact that, that we aren't giving up. We are continuing and we will continue to fight and we will be victorious. I, I really think we will. I think that the principles that we espouse are core and I think they're timeless, quite frankly, which I think is why we have been successful as a profession and why people find value in us. Um, if we didn't have value, we wouldn't be in existence. You know, um, mm -hmm. I don't know what the numbers are now, but you know, it used to be that we there were more libraries in America than McDonald's, right? And I right. don't know if that's still true or not, but even in the last decade, that was the case, right? And that's amazing. You see the importance of that because people want them and they continue to build and grow. I mean. City of Dallas just added a couple new, I think they added one or two new branches. Um, you know, every time people build libraries, people aren't closing, they're adding more. And that's because people yeah. need the libraries more and more. So I think I think the future is bright. I think we have a lot um, going for us. And I think that, you know, it's a struggle, but I think the end result is going to be amazing. Oh, uh, yep. Now, heart's totally light, going to float right out of this conversation. Um, my last question for you, Peter, as we end, as we began with gratitude, just thank you so much, just that intellectual freedom gives us this opportunity to learn from each other. So I'd like to just conclude by asking you for my own sake and the sake of our audience, um, is there anything you'd like to share with us about what you're currently learning? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> wow. Well, I've learned a lot. We have a ballot measure for uh, some partial tax renewal. So I've learned a lot about partial taxes the last couple of weeks. I've also learned about um, economic redevelopment agencies too. So sometimes I learned some really fun, weird things. Um, but I think the thing that I'm really interested in learning right now is about good conflict. Um, yeah. You know, I think sometimes we are afraid of, of, of that. Um, and I'm reading a book now. Um, and I think it's called, um, it's, I, I'm, I'm the, the TV show was the good fight with, um, that was a TV show, but I think this book is called the good fight and it's not, oh. it's not the same. And I, and I may have the, the title wrong of the book. Um, I just got it the other day, but it's about 
conflict and how, and I just started it, so I don't know the full thing, but the idea sure. that it's okay to dis, it's okay to disagree. And that's, that's part of discourse, um, you know, and, and that's what discourse is a good conflict. You know, you and I can have different opinions on, on consequential issues, but that doesn't mean we have to hate each other. Um, you know, it, but I do think that, you know, we, we need to learn how to do that a little bit better in this country. I agree. And um, just because you're giving me the opportunity to, again, state some gratitude, there have been times where even you and I personally have not seen eye to eye on like a resolution, yeah. and, but because yeah. you lend your voice, because you listen to the voices of others, I think that's been a classic example of where I have seen governance go well, yeah. you know, and it is that good kind of productive conflict that both parties come back richer and more informed for the experience. And we did the best by the process that we could. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to look that book up and I'll drop it in the links because I'm going to read it too. But yeah. that's, that's some great stuff. Um, I might just leave the tax stuff to you. I might not pick that part up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't recommend. I mean, and, and I'm a little yeah. bit of a nerd. I love how libraries operate in different states because I've lived in different ones and worked. So I, it's right. such, a, such a fascinating topic to see how we're funded and organized. And, um, and we're a little bit of a different beast here because of of how we're organized at Sacramento. So it's it's always fascinating to see how. Um, and I was really thinking that too is sometimes we forget that we can't compare apples to apples, library to library, because of those funding right. things. You know, people people forget that every structure, every funding, every tax, it's it's different how that how that works, and that can be frustrating. And and then articulating that to the public in general can be too. Yeah. You're right. Because yeah. if it's hard for us as the people who live it and eat it and breathe it every day. Yeah. yeah. I wish you well on the journey. And I thank you again for taking the time to connect with me um, and share with us um, your perspective on these topics. It means a lot, Pierre. Thanks, Sam. Really appreciate it. You take care. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.